Hello, my name is Stacy Vernon. I am a clinician at the Center for Brain Health. We are part of the University of Texas at Dallas, and I'm excited to be able to speak with you all today about the latest research in the field of brain health. The Center for Brain Health has actually been around for over two decades. Um, you'll see here uh, images of now we've expanded to two buildings side by side um, here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, actually just nearby uh, Love Field and the uh, UT Southwestern Medical Facilities. Um, we've been dedicated to advancing the field of brain health, which you'll hear from myself and two of my colleagues as well in this retreat format Something that's unique about what we do is that we focus on improving and maintaining brain health and brain performance throughout one's lifetime. So expanding on this idea of what is brain health, it's not just the absence of a problem with the brain, right? I've had a traumatic brain injury or a concussion or a stroke or I'm having changes in memory and thinking related to dementia or Alzheimer's. The fact that there's the absence of disease or disorder or an injury is not the only indication of brain health. And that's what we've been dedicated to learning more about in our research. And so I wanna tell you uh, today some of the advances, um, some of the new initiatives and research that we are being um, a part of on a, on a national and then sometimes an international scale. And then my second goal for our discussion today is to give you practical ways that you can positively impact your brain health and performance today. Uh, that is something that is a passion of all of us here at the Center for Brain Health. We want to make the research and the science that we are gathering translatable and practical to everyone. So that being said, I'm going to talk to you in particular today about a research initiative that we launched at the beginning of 2020. Um, that's des designed specifically to define brain health in a new way. It is a collaborative venture. You can see all these folks here, even my face here on the screen cuts off a few, but I wanted to include this slide to show you how collaborative this project is. You'll see our co-leaders, you might recognize Dr. Sandy Chapman, who is our founder and director. Um, but then you'll also notice a number of folks from across the country and across the world who are contributing their scientific minds and body of research to this project, this latest initiative that I'm going to talk to you about today. And that is called the Brain Health Project. The Brain Health Project um, has been a uh, passion and cornerstone of Dr. Sandy Chapman's research over the last uh, 20 years. This really has come to fruition um, out of her body of research. One really important thing that you'll hear myself and the, my other colleagues talk about is that the Brain Health Project and the majority of the research that we are a part of at the Center for Brain Health is founded on the idea of neuroplasticity. Bottom line, what is neuroplasticity? It simply asserts and has been proven that the brain changes based on how we use it and what we do day to day. Our brain health and our brain performance is not fixed. And that's actually quite a revolutionary idea in the field of brain health and in neuroscience in general. Um, for decades, it was asserted that actually, no, the brain um, is fixed, its capabilities are fixed, its health and the um, projected health of one's brain is fixed. So now to have this opportunity to share with you all the hope and the possibility of being able to impact our brain every day based on how we use it is what the Brain Health Project is all about. Now, what is this? What am I showing you now? This is our component wheel of brain health. Now, 
I understand there are tiny words on the screen. And basically the reason I want to show you this is not so that you now quickly write down all the components, um, is to illustrate to you how holistic we can be when we are thinking about positively impacting our brain health and performance. You and I can be very holistic in how we impact brain health. Well, now what does that mean? What it means to me is I hear in my role as a clinician at the Center for Brain Health, I hear folks who will come um, to maybe some of our lectures or some of the other programs that we offer and say, oh yes, I'm, I am very interested in brain health. I'm, I'm noticing I'm having problems with my memory. You know, it's not, it, you know, I'm not very worried about, but I just notice things kind of slip here and there, or gosh, I have a hard time paying attention. I just noticed that. Yes, so I am definitely interested in learning more about brain health. So one thing that we strive to do and that our research strives to do is to help people expand their understanding of what brain health is. And this component wheel is a great illustration of it. What I want you to take away from this, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about it in the slides to come, are these four big, big sections of this wheel. The top purple section we call cognition. The yellow section is interaction. The mm, teal-ish green section is well-being. And the pink is daily life. So you'll notice that we don't have a whole section for memory. There's memory actually in, in this portion here of com in complex memory, right, in cognition. You'll notice that you don't have a whole section that's attention. It's in a portion of cognition, but it's not the whole thing. And then you'll notice what other factors are here that might surprise you, right? Does daily life, what we do every day, surprise you as a key component to impacting brain health and performance? What about well being? What about one's level of social interaction, depth of social interaction, right? All of these factors play a part in driving our brain health and performance today and in the future. So I'm going to talk about the latest research and what you can do to positively impact your brain health and performance. Now, first, what is cognition? Is it just memory or attention like I was talking about? I bet you're getting the sense now that you understand. No, that's, that's not the case. Cognition is how you think, learn, problem solve, remember, and more. It includes both complex and specific thinking capacities that are required to take in information, process it, come back to it later, and combine it in different ways to create something completely new. All right, so think about that. It is, when I talk about complex and specific thinking capacities, you might consider something like a specific thinking capacity might be remembering, something that's important, but very common. For example, one's phone number, one's social security number, that, that's basic memory, right? Complex might be combining information that I learned from a newspaper article, from a friend I recently talked to, and from information I might have recalled from when I was in school, and coming up with a new idea that I'm going to advance. That's an example of complex thinking, right? We might talk about that in terms of innovation. Then it's also important to understand that with cognition, how efficiently and rapidly you seek to achieve new mental challenges depends on your cognitive adeptness and fitness. Now, fitness, we understand cognitive fitness, right? So how well I'm able to use these abilities. Cognitive adeptness is something that I think uh, is often underrepresented when we talk to folks about brain health and brain performance. And adeptness means, do you feel flexible, right? I think for, for many of us, smartness or intelligence is often equated with maybe watching the folks who, who are guests on Jeopardy or who are, who are answering um, trivia questions in a game, for example. Oh, that's smart. When you think about if I'm talking about the difference between complex and specific thinking, Actually, recalling basic information is more of a specific thinking process, right? 
this cognitive adeptness is actually more complex thinking abilities, right? Being able to, okay, I say, for example, okay, I know I've done this the same way over and over again. It's not working for me. How do I shift? How am I flexible? How do I do something new? When we do that, just a little preview, when we do that, we advance our brain health and performance. When we do something new in a complex way, and I'll add to this actually with meaning that's meaningful to us, we harness the power of our brain to push our brain health forward. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the practical steps. Daily life, now I can see that my, my uh, face here is covering up. What is daily life? Oh, it's multifaceted. It's your unique and individual daily responsibilities and lifestyle habits like your fitness, level of exercise, sleep, that set the pace for how you need to use your brain and impacts your brain health. So we look at that in our research. We also look at well-being, which is beyond just feeling, you know, okay, well, I don't feel depressed, I don't feel anxious. It's also your emotional sense of yourself despite the context you're in, despite the circumstances you're in. Your well-being affects the way we think and vice versa. So do you feel happy, content, satisfied? And then interaction, which is more just than just how many friends and family members I might interact, but it's also the level, depth, and meaning that we have in those relationships. That impacts brain health and performance. So I want to tell you a bit about the exciting information that we've already gleaned from the Brain Health Project because I want you to be able to understand um, that there's science that's driving what we assert as our very practical ways to improve brain health. So in this latest research, and this is hot off the presses, it is, we have just submitted our first uh, research paper for publication about this project um, based on our hundreds of research publications that we've had in the past. So this is hot off the presses for you all. As I mentioned, our um, Brain Health Project launched in um, March of 2020. And what have we learned? Well, we have learned that we want to define, measure, and improve brain health at any age. How are we gonna do that? Well, what we do is we are engaging our participants in a number of ways. Now, here's the, the cadence of that pilot project. I just wanted to include this slide to show you all, not the specifics of it necessarily, but how quickly um, we saw improvement. Um, this was over just 12 to 14 weeks for each participant um, that they saw improvements in their brain health and performance. Um, they engaged in some assessments. This is all online. They engaged in talking with brain health coaches like myself. They also engaged in training, which was all virtual. So they watched some brief videos. They were encouraged to do some exercises throughout the day that were designed to uh, push forward their brain health and performance. And then they were tested again at the end. So we had a pre and a post testing. Um, and what is some of our preliminary results? Okay, this is what's really exciting for me. Um, the first question we wanted to know is, did the brain health index, that's the test I was telling you about, did it get better at the end of these 12 weeks when they did the training, which we call SMART, that's what it says, SMART Plus, right? When they did this training. Now the training is designed to boost that whole, remember the purple section of my circle that said cognition? It's giving folks practical strategies for boosting their cognition. So our question is, did the brain health index improve? Did it get better? Someone tested better the second time around when they took the brain health index after having really practiced and focused on their cognition? And the answer is yes, we did see a substantial change. So that's very exciting again. Um, adding to that idea that the brain can change based on how we use it. Next is, and I can see that my face is in, impacting this, were there effects of age or gender in the change for the brain health index? So the question really is based on, okay, well, you know, maybe I'm a young person, so I might benefit more. Maybe um, I am 
a female, so maybe I'd benefit more or less, for example, did, were there really effects over the lifespan and between male and female um, that impacted the pre and the post for the brain health index? And the answer is no. So think about this. Let's unpack this a little bit more. What I mean is we had folks in the pilot, in this research study, which is ongoing, from the ages of 18 to 87. So 18 years of age all the way to 87. We had about 60% women, about 40% men. We hope to get more men in our study as we move along. Throughout the lifespan, there was equal opportunity for our participants to advance their brain health and performance regardless of age and gender. And we saw that based on our testing, our pre and our post testing. So that takeaway for me is over the course of our lives, there is opportunity to improve my brain health and performance day to day. And if you remember, again, thinking back to this wheel, this circle that I showed you, it's not just cognition. So I'm gonna to move to this next slide and show you a bit about what I mean about that. Okay, now you don't have to know all, what all of these very complex graphs mean, but what I wanted to do is illustrate to you about the types of training that we had folks do, because this is important to think about this holistic view of brain health. We had folks do that training in cognition. Remember I mentioned it's called SMART. That's teaching them strategies for how to better use their brain power every day. But we also provided information and encouragement to practice improving our participants' sleep and how they manage stress. And the more that our participants used the training, accessed the training, accessed the exercises, the more we saw improvements in their testing at the second time point, right? So it, again, age and gender being equal, right? The more that someone engaged in a very conscious way with our training, the more they saw improvements in their second testing time point. So last one though, this is really interesting, and then I'm gonna go through some case um, studies to, to tell you all more and on an individual level what happened. But the question that we had is, what was the contribution of the change in individual components of brain health to change the brain health index? So what does that mean? Essentially what that means is, we wanted to know, we have this, law, this brain health index test. We are asking folks to answer questions in all of the areas that I told you about on that wheel. So they're doing tasks that look at their cognition. They're answering questions about their well-being. They're answering questions about their daily life. And they're answering questions about their social interaction. One of our research questions was, well, what was the driving force to improve their overall test results? In other words, when we give folks training, is it mainly cognition that improves over time? Is it mainly daily life that improves over time? Is it mainly social interaction? Is it mainly well-being? Well, the answer is, it depends on the person. What we found was very interesting. We saw, and I'm gonna show you in these case studies, examples, participant to participant, that they could choose to focus on any of the areas of that wheel and see improvements in their brain health and performance over time. So I'm gonna give you three examples. First, this is a case study of a woman who was 42 years of age. Again, you don't have to worry so much. This is just an example of their, what their test results look like when they look at them on, online who voiced to our team that she wanted to focus on cognition. Now remember, cognition is this purple part of this wheel. If you can see this purple part of this wheel. 
she wanted to focus on really using her brain to strategize and she identified a goal which was to improve her job performance she was in charge of improving and managing the performance of a number of employees and she wanted to use the strategies that she would learn uh, in our cognitive training to do that and you see the improvement so for her she improved because she focused on cognition and then also we had this nice byproduct of seeing her daily life and well-being improve along with it so an example of really focusing on cognition next we have a woman who is an 18 year old student at a local university you'll notice for her she maintained in cognition her focus was she really wanted to improve in her social interaction and you see she did just that which overall improved her score from a 48.29 to a 69.61 so in addition she reported that not only did she then when she improved her social network she really intentionally reached out to others she saw improvements in her general daily life, sleep, uh, sense of purpose and meaning in her daily activities, fitness, and in her well being. So, all of these things were impacted when she chose to focus on her social interactions. And then finally, we, we got this a lot in our early presentations um, of this research. Well, what about people who went down? from their time one test to their time two test. And you notice this individual, she went down. This is a 77 year old um, female who went down um, it, from time one to time two. I think this is really important to show. And the reason being is this individual, when she came to her time two assessment, shared with us that she knew, she knew she would probably have gone down. And the reason being, she'd actually had a significant health crisis in between time one and time two. And she understood now because of the holistic nature of our component wheel, that it wouldn't just be in one area that she would likely be negatively impacted because of this significant crisis. She knew she would be limited in her social interaction and you see her social interaction went down. That's this little yellow part. And her daily life went down because she wasn't able to sleep as well and, and focus on fitness, for example. But the thing she shared with us after her time to assessment was, was something that I think is reflected in her well being score, which is the green here at the bottom. You'll notice her well being stayed very um, constant. She maintained that. And she said she remained hopeful that she could again rebound and regain in these areas of cognition, interaction, and daily life. And that's because she understood that regardless of age, she can positively impact her brain health and performance at any time. So she left, even though, and even though she knew she didn't do as well on her second testing, she left in a very optimistic frame of mind. And that to me is quite important. And that's something that I wanna share with you all now, which is what are our next steps? In our research, we're going to continue to focus on ways that we can support folks in all areas, cognition, daily life, well-being, and interaction to improve their brain health. And also work towards even more precise measurements and interventions to help folks understand um, for example, what would be the difference between the 18 year old and her understanding that she wanted to improve her social connectedness, her social interaction versus the 42 year old who knew she wanted to use cognition to impact her work. How do we help folks on a very individualized level boost their brain health and performance based on what their needs are and perhaps even where they are in their phase of life. So what can I tell you today? Now, my colleagues are going to talk to you a bit more about cognition in the future. Um, but I want to talk also about lifestyle interventions. This is something that we're learning more and more about in our research about brain health. So what are the factors that impact how well we're able to use our cognitive abilities? Well, one is in the area of well-being. 
So we all understand that stress, anxiety can negatively impact us. But what about our sense of gratitude and feeling hopeful? So I know that for you all, the theme of this retreat is adding joy, bringing joy to our life. That is very much in line in a sense of an expanded view of well-being, right? What we want to do is move from not just surviving, well, thank goodness I'm not depressed, thank goodness I'm not anxious, for example, but into thriving, uh, meaning what am I hopeful and grateful for every day? Our sleep quality. Not only am I getting good sleep, right, but do I feel energized during the day, right? Do I, not, am I just checking off the box while well, I got good sleep, but am I feeling a good sense of energy throughout the day? Stress mastery. So moving beyond just stress management or lowering stress in our lives, but really what could we do to optimize stress? How do we see stress as a, net, as a positive rather than a negative? And then are we taking time to relax every day so that we have a moment to allow our body, mind, and emotions to become relaxed and to have a break from stress? And then social connectedness, asking, do we have people in our lives that we provide support and care and that provide support and care to us? So specifically, what can we do? Well, I want to talk to you first about why. Um, I know we've talked about in general brain health and performance, but another um, advance in the field of uh, brain health research is this idea of cognitive reserve. So these steps that we're encouraging folks to take on a day-to-day -day basis related to improving brain health and performance is making deposits, essentially, into your cognitive reserve. So every time I get a good night's sleep or perhaps um, focus on gratitude, or perhaps have a really positive social interaction, what I'm actually doing, in addition to improving my cognition and taking those cognitive steps that you'll learn from my um, colleagues, what I'm actually doing is making a deposit into my cognitive reserve. Now, just like a financial reserve, why would we have a financial reserve? Well, it's actually thinking about, well, what happens if there is a damage, disease, disorder, or even something um, as impactful, but maybe not as understood as a stressful situation, right? So maybe I didn't have, you know, a, a, something that actually physically hurt my brain, but what if I had an incredibly stressful or difficult situation? I might need to, and the brain might need to use some of that cognitive reserve, make a withdrawal from that cognitive reserve. So it goes to, you know, goes to show just as in our financial reserves, it's good to have good savings. It's also good to continue to contribute to our cognitive reserve over time. One way that we can do that is to deeply engage in new and interesting tasks regularly. Just like what you're doing here today um, in your retreat, right? You're learning from, from a variety of different people, right? So I would challenge you all in any of the activities and speakers that you hear in this retreat to, and you'll hear this from my colleagues as well, after you watch um, or listen to one of the speakers, take time to challenge yourself to identify your top two takeaways from that lecture or speaker. What are the top two things you have learned were the most impactful, were the most meaningful to you, and how are you going to act on that information? That is deeply engaging in new and interesting tasks. And by doing that, blink, you can consider yourself depositing into your cognitive reserve, right? Putting it into that piggy bank that is your cognitive reserve. Um, what other things can you do? Again, based on research, here's what we're learning you can eliminate multitasking, and I'm going to add to this, limit distractions. So when you are watching these speakers, when you are engaging in the activities related to this retreat, do you have the television on? Are you having, a, you know, do, can you hear music in the background? Are you having a conversation? The more you can limit that and have your focus become more singular, the more you're able to come up with those top two takeaways that I was telling you about for each speaker, right? The more you're able to use your cognitive capacities. Another challenge 
and we hear this over and over again, is to unplug technology for a five minute break, right? We are constantly accessible to others. What about it for five minutes to unplug? do something new. I was saying engaging deeply and new and exciting opportunities enhances our cognition and plink, makes a deposit in that cognitive reserve, right? Reconnect or connect with a loved one, right? We might have to think creatively about how we do that in this day and age. That's good, right? That's okay. Um, what if we reframe that as well? Well, that's even adding to the brain healthy opportunity of this experience because I'm having to think creatively in a new way about how I'm going to connect with an 11 one. Maybe I'm going to interact via one of my tech technologies. Perhaps I'm going to have socially distance outside experience, etc. Uh, write a gratitude list. So as I mentioned, well-being is far more than the absence of depression, anxiety, sadness. Um, we really need to cultivate this idea of appreciation, gratitude, joy. Um, go for a walk in nature. One of our, you know, key research collaborators, collaborators is doing quite a bit of research in the importance of being outside and being in nature to elevate our well-being and overall brain health. And getting sleep, as I mentioned before, trying you know, to get seven to eight hours of sleep, making sure that we get rest, and then asking, do I feel energized in the day, right? So finally, if you would like to learn more, I highly encourage you all to visit our website. It's centerforbrainhealth.org. There you'll learn more about our latest research initiatives. You will have links to our recent news articles to learn more about brain health and performance, um, to learn more about our different uh, research labs, as well as our um, uh, to the public offerings. We offer lectures and talks throughout the year. So I wanna say thank you so much for allowing me to speak with you today. Um, please feel free to reach out and contact the center at any time we wanna be a resource to you, and particularly um, to the Dallas-Fort Worth community. Thank you so much. <laughs>